This is section 10 of the One Million Pound Banknote and Other News Stories by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Majestic Literary Fossil by Mark Twain. Read by John Greenman. If I were required to guess offhand and without collision with higher winds, what is the bottom cause of the amazing material and intellectual advancement of the last fifty years, I should guess that it was the modern-born and previously non-existent disposition on the part of men to believe that a new idea can have value. With the long roll of the mighty names of history present in our minds, we are not privileged to doubt that for the past twenty or thirty centuries every conspicuous civilization in the world has produced intellects able to invent and create the things which make our day a wonder perhaps we may be justified in inferring then that the reason they did not do it was that the public reverence for old ideas and hostility to new ones always stood in their way and was a wall they could not break down or climb over the prevailing tone of old books regarding new ideas is one of suspicion and uneasiness at times, and at other times contempt. By contrast, our day is indifferent to old ideas, and even considers that their age makes their value questionable, but jumps at a new idea with enthusiasm and high hope, a hope which is high because it has not been accustomed to being disappointed i make no guess as to just when this disposition was born to us but it certainly is ours was not possessed by any century before us is our peculiar mark and badge and is doubtless the bottom reason why we are a race of lightning-shod mercuries and proud of it instead of being like our ancestors a race of plodding crabs and proud of that. So recent is this change from a three or four thousand year twilight to the flash and glare of open day that I have walked in both, and yet I am not old. Nothing is today as it was when I was an urchin, but when I was an urchin nothing was much different from what it had always been in this world. Take a single detail, for example, medicine galen could have come into my sick room at any time during my first seven years i mean any day when it wasn't fishing weather and there wasn't any choice but school or sickness and he could have sat down there and stood my doctors out asking a question he would have smelt around among the wilderness of cups and bottles and vials on the table and the shelves and missed not a stench that used to glad him two thousand years before nor discovered one that was of a later date. He would have examined me and run across only one disappointment. I was already salivated. I would have him there, for I was always salivated. Calomel was so cheap. He would get out his lancet then, but I would have him again. Our family doctor didn't allow blood to accumulate in the system. However, he could take dipper and ladle and freight me up with old familiar doses that had come down from Adam to his time and mine, and he could go out with a wheelbarrow and gather weeds and offal and build some more, while those others were getting in their work. And if our reverend doctor came and found him there, he would be dumb with awe and would get down and worship him. Whereas if Galen should appear among us today, he could not stand anybody's watch. He would inspire no awe. He would be told he was a back number, and it would surprise him to see that that fact counted against him instead of in his favor. He wouldn't know our medicines. He wouldn't know our practice. And the first time he tried to introduce his own, we would hang him. This introduction brings me to my literary relic. It is a Dictionary of Medicine by Dr. James of London, assisted by Mr. Boswell's doctor, Samuel Johnson, and is a hundred and fifty years old. 
it having been published at the time of the rebellion of forty five if it had been sent against the pretender's troops there probably wouldn't have been a survivor in eighteen sixty one this deadly book was still working the cemeteries down in virginia for three generations and a half it had been going quietly along enriching the earth with its slain up to its last free day it was trusted and believed in and its devastating advice taken as was shown by notes inserted between its leaves but our troops captured it and brought it home and it has been out of business since these remarks from its preface are in the true spirit of the olden time sodden with worship of the old disdain of the new if we inquire into the improvements which have been made by the moderns we shall be forced to confess that we have so little reason to value ourselves beyond the ancients or to be tempted to contemn them that we cannot give stronger or more convincing proofs of our own ignorance as well as our pride among all the systematical writers i think there are very few who refuse the preference to heron fabricius ab aqua pendente as a person of unquestioned learning and judgment and yet is he not ashamed to let his readers know that celsus among the latins paulus aegonata among the greeks and albucasis among the arabians whom i am unwilling to place among the moderns though he lived but six hundred years since are the triumvirate to whom he principally stands indebted for the assistance he had received from them in composing his excellent book in a previous paragraph are puffs of galen hippocrates and other debris of the old silurian period of medicine how many operations are there now in use which were unknown to the ancients that is true the surest way for a nation's scientific men to prove that they were proud and ignorant was to claim to have found out something fresh in the course of a thousand years or so evidently the peoples of this book's day regarded themselves as children and their remote ancestors as the only grown-up people that had existed consider the contrast without offence without over egotism our own scientific men may and do regard themselves as grown people and their grandfathers as children the change here presented is probably the most sweeping that has ever come over mankind in the history of the race it is the utter reversal in a couple of generations of an attitude which had been maintained without challenge or interruption from the earliest antiquity it amounts to creating man over again on a new plan he was a canal boat before he is an ocean greyhound today the change from reptile to bird was not more tremendous and it took longer it is curious if you read between the lines what this author says about brer albacassus you detect that in venturing to compliment him he has to whistle a little to keep his courage up because albacassus lived but six hundred years since and therefore came so uncomfortably near being a modern that one couldn't respect him without risk phlebotomy venesection terms to signify bleeding are not often heard in our day because we have ceased to believe that the best way to make a bank or a body healthy is to squander its capital but in our author's time the physician went around with a hatful of lancets on his person all the time and took a hack at every patient whom he found still alive he robbed his man of pounds and pounds of blood at a single operation the details of this sort in this book make terrific reading apparently even the healthy did not escape but were bled twelve times a year on a particular day of the month and exhaustively purged besides here is a specimen of the vigorous old-time practice it occurs in our author's adoring biography of a dr Eratheus, a licensed assassin of homer's time or thereabouts 
in a quincy he used venesection and allowed the blood to flow till the patient was ready to faint away there is no harm in trying to cure a headache in our day you can't do it but you can get more or less entertainment out of trying and that is something besides you live to tell about it and that is more a century or so ago you could have had the first of these features in rich variety but you might fail of the other once and once would do i quote as dissections of persons who have died of severe headaches which have been related by authors are too numerous to be inserted in this place we shall here abridge some of the most curious and important observations relating to this subject collected by the celebrated bonetus the celebrated bonetus's observation number one seems to me a sufficient sample all by itself of what people used to have to stand any time between the creation of the world and the birth of your father and mine when they had the disastrous luck to get a head ache a certain merchant about forty years of age of a melancholic habit and deeply involved in the cares of the world was during the dog days seized with a violent pain of his head which some time after obliged him to keep his bed i being called ordered venesection in the arms the application of leeches to the vessels of his nostrils forehead and temples as also to those behind his ears i likewise prescribed the application of cupping glasses with scarification to his back but notwithstanding these precautions he died if any surgeon skilled in arteriotonomy had been present i should have also ordered that operation i looked for arteriotonomy in this same dictionary and found this definition the opening of an artery with a view of taking away blood here was a person who was being bled in the arms foreheads nostrils back temples and behind the ears yet the celebrated bonetus was not satisfied but wanted to open an artery with a view to inserting a pump probably notwithstanding these precautions he died no art of speech could more quaintly convey this butcher's innocent surprise now that we know what the celebrated bonetus did when he wanted to relieve a headache it is no trouble to infer that if he wanted to comfort a man that had a stomach ache he disemboweled him i have given one observation a single headache case but the celebrated bonetus follows it with eleven more without enlarging upon the matter i merely note this coincidence they all died not one of these people got well yet this obtuse hyena sets down every little gory detail of the several assassinations as complacently as if he imagined he was doing a useful and meritorious work in perpetuating the methods of his crimes observations indeed they are confessions according to this book the ashes of an ass's hoof mixed with woman's milk cures chilblains length of time required not stated another item the constant use of milk is bad for the teeth and causes them to rot and loosens the gums yet in our day babies use it constantly without hurtful results this author thinks you ought to wash out your mouth with wine before venturing to drink milk presently when we come to notice what fiendish decoctions those people introduced into their stomachs by way of medicine we shall wonder that they could have been afraid of milk it appears that they had false teeth in those days they were made of ivory sometimes sometimes of bone and were thrust into the natural sockets and lashed to each other and to the neighboring teeth with wires or with silk threads they were not to eat with nor to laugh with because they dropped out when not in repose you could smile with them but you had to practice first or you would overdo it they were not for business but just decoration 
they filled the bill according to their lights this author says the flesh of swine nourishes above all other eatables in another place he mentions a number of things and says these are very easy to be digested so is pork this is probably a lie but he is pretty handy in that line and when he hasn't anything of the sort in stock himself he gives some other expert an opening for instance under the head of attractives he introduces paracelsus who tells of a nameless specific quantity of it not set down which is able to draw a hundred pounds of flesh to itself distance not stated and then proceeds it happened in our own days that an attractive of this kind drew a certain man's lungs up into his mouth by which he had the misfortune to be suffocated this is more than doubtful in the first place his mouth couldn't accommodate his lungs in fact his hat couldn't secondly his heart being more eligibly situated it would have got the start of his lungs and being a lighter body it would have sailed in ahead and occupied the premises thirdly you will take notice a man with his heart in his mouth hasn't any room left for his lungs he has got all he can attend to and finally the man must have had the attractive in his hat and when he saw what was going to happen he would have removed it and sat down on it indeed he would and then how could it choke him to death i don't believe the thing ever happened at all paracelsus adds this effort i myself saw a plaster which attracted as much water as was sufficient to fill a cistern and by these very attractives branches may be borne from trees and which is still more surprising a cow may be carried up into the air paracelsus is dead now he was always straining himself that way they liked a touch of mystery along with their medicine in the olden time and the medicine man of that day like the medicine man of our indian tribes did what he could to meet the requirement arcanum a kind of remedy whose manner of preparation or singular efficacy is industriously concealed in order to enhance its value by the chemists it is generally defined a thing secret incorporeal and immortal which cannot be known by man unless by experience for it is the virtue of every thing which operates a thousand times more than the thing itself to me the butt end of this explanation is not altogether clear a little of what they knew about natural history in the early times is exposed here and there in the dictionary the spider it is more common than welcome in houses both the spider and its web are used in medicine the spider is said to avert the paroxysms of fevers if it be applied to the pulse of the wrist or the temples but it is peculiarly recommended against a quartan being enclosed in the shell of a hazelnut among approved remedies i find that the distilled water of black spiders is an excellent cure for wounds and that this was one of the choice secrets of sir walter raleigh the spider which some call the catcher or wolf being beaten into a plaster then sewed up in linen and applied to the forehead or temples prevents the returns of a tertian there is another kind of spider which spins a white fine and thick web one of this sort wrapped in leather and hung about the arm will avert the fit of a quartan boiled in oil of roses and instilled into the ears it eases pains in those parts dioscorides lib two cap sixty eight thus we find that spiders have in all ages been celebrated for their febrifuge virtues and it is worthy of remark that a spider is usually given to monkeys and is esteemed a sovereign remedy for the disorders those animals are principally subject to then follows a long account of how a dying woman who had suffered nine hours a day with an ague during eight weeks and who had been bled dry some dozens of times meantime without apparent benefit was at last forced to swallow several wads of 
spider's web whereupon she straightway mended and promptly got well so the sage is full of enthusiasm over the spider webs and mentions only in the most casual way the discontinuance of the daily bleedings plainly never suspecting that this had anything to do with the cure as concerning the venomous nature of spiders scaliger takes notice of a certain species of them which he had forgotten whose poison was of so great force as to affect one vincentinus through the sole of his shoe by only treading on it the sage takes that in without a strain but the following case was a trifle too bulky for him as his comment reveals in gascony observes scaliger there is a very small spider which running over a looking-glass will crack the same by the force of her poison a mere fable but he finds no fault with the following facts remarkable is the enmity recorded between this creature and the serpent as also the toad of the former it is reported that lying as he thinks securely under the shadow of some tree the spider lets herself down by her thread and striking her proboscis or sting into the head with that force and efficacy injecting likewise her venomous juice that wringing himself about he immediately grows giddy and quickly after dies when the toad is bit or stung in fight with this creature the lizard adder or other that is poisonous she finds relief from plantain to which she resorts in her combat with the toad the spider useth the same stratagem as with the serpent hanging by her own thread from the bough of some tree and striking her sting into her enemy's head upon which the other enraged swells up and sometimes bursts to this effect is the relation of erasmus which he saith he had from one of the spectators of a person lying along upon the floor of his chamber in the summer-time to sleep in a supine posture when a toad creeping out of some green rushes brought just before in to adorn the chimney gets upon his face and with his feet sits across his lips to force off the toad says the historian would have been accounted sudden death to the sleeper and to leave her there very cruel and dangerous so that upon consultation it was concluded to find out a spider which together with her web and the window she was fastened to was brought carefully and so contrived as to be held perpendicularly to the man's face which was no sooner done but the spider discovering his enemy let himself down and struck in his dart afterwards betaking himself up again to his web the toad swelled but as yet kept his station the second wound is given quickly after by the spider upon which he swells yet more but remained alive still the spider coming down again by his thread gives the third blow and the toad taking off his feet from over the man's mouth fell off dead to which the sage appends this grave remark and so much for the historical part then he passes on to a consideration of the effects and cures of the poison one of the most interesting things about this tragedy is the double sex of the toad and also of the spider now the sage quotes from one turner i remember when a very young practitioner being sent for to a certain woman whose custom was usually when she went to the cellar by candlelight to go also a spider hunting setting fire to their webs and burning them with the flame of the candle still as she pursued them it happened at length after this whimsy had been followed a long time one of them sold his life much dearer than those hundreds she had destroyed for lighting upon the melting tallow of her candle near the flame and his legs being entangled therein so that he could not extricate himself the flame or heat coming on 
he was made a sacrifice to his cruel persecutor who delighting her eyes with the spectacle still waiting for the flame to take hold of him he presently burst with a great crack and threw his liquor some into her eyes but mostly upon her lips by means of which flinging away her candle she cried out for help as fancying herself killed already with the poison however in the night her lips swelled up excessively and one of her eyes was much inflamed also her tongue and gums were somewhat affected and whether from the nausea excited by the thoughts of the liquor getting into her mouth or from the poisonous impressions communicated by the nervous fibrilla of those parts to those of the ventricle a continual vomiting attended to take off which when i was called i ordered a glass of mulled sack with a scruple of salt of wormwood and some hours after a theriacal bolus which she flung up again i am brocaded the lips with the oil of scorpions mixed with the oil of roses and in consideration of the ophthalmy though i was not certain but the heat of the liquor raised by the flame of the candle before the body of the creature burst might as well as the venom excite the disturbance although mr boyle's case of a person blinded by this liquor dropping from the living spider makes the latter sufficient yet observing the great tumefaction of the lips together with the other symptoms not likely to arise from simple heat i was inclined to believe a real poison in the case and therefore not daring to let her blood in the arm if a man's throat were cut in those old days the doctor would come and bleed the other end of him i did however with good success set leeches to her temples which took off much of the inflammation and her pain was likewise abated by instilling into her eyes a thin mucilage of the seeds of quinces and white poppies extracted with rose-water yet the swelling on the lips increased upon which in the night she wore a cataplasm prepared by boiling the leaves of scordium rue and elder flowers and afterwards thickened with the meal of vetches in the meantime her vomiting having left her she had given her between whiles a little draught of distilled water of cardus benedictus and scordium with some of the theriaca dissolved and upon going off of the symptoms an old woman came luckily in who with assurance suitable to those people whose ignorance and poverty is their safety and protection took off the dressings promising to cure her in two days time although she made it as many weeks yet had the reputation of the cure applying only plantain leaves bruised and mixed with cobwebs dropping the juice into her eye and giving some spoonfuls of the same inwardly two or three times a day so ends the wonderful affair whereupon the sage gives mr turner the following shot strengthening it with italics and passes calmly on i must remark upon this history that the plantain as a cooler was much more likely to cure this disorder than warmer applications and medicines how strange that narrative sounds to-day and how grotesque when one reflects that it was a grave contribution to medical science by an old and reputable physician here was all this to do two weeks of it over a woman who had scorched her eye and her lips with candle grease the poor wench is as elaborately dosed bled embrocated and otherwise harried and bedeviled as if there had been really something the matter with her and when a sensible old woman comes along at last and treats the trivial case in a sensible way the educated ignoramus rails at her ignorance serenely unconscious of his own it is pretty suggestive of the former snail pace of medical progress that the spider retained his terrors during three thousand years and only lost them within the last thirty or forty observe what imagination can do this same young woman used to be so affected by the strong imaginary smell which emanated from the burning spiders that 
the objects about her seemed to turn round she grew faint also with cold sweats and sometimes a light vomiting there could have been beer in that cellar as well as spiders here are some more of the effects of imagination Sinertus takes notice of the signs of the bite or sting of this insect to be a stupor or numbness upon the part with a sense of cold horror or swelling of the abdomen paleness of the face involuntary tears trembling contractions a blank convulsions cold sweats but these latter chiefly when the poison has been received inwardly whereas the modern physician holds that a few spiders taken inwardly by a bird or a man will do neither party any harm the above signs are not restricted to spider bites often they merely indicate fright i have seen a person with a hornet in his pantaloons exhibit them all as to the cure not slighting the usual alexipharmics taken internally the place bitten must be immediately washed with salt water or a sponge dipped in hot vinegar or fomented with a decoction of mallows origanum and mother of thyme after which a cataplasm must be laid on the leaves of bay rue leeks and the meal of barley boiled with vinegar or of garlic and onions contused with goat's dung and fat figs meantime the patient should eat garlic and drink wine freely as for me i should prefer the spider bite let us close this review with a sample or two of the earthquakes which the old-time doctor used to introduce into his patient when he could find room under this head we have alexander's golden antidote which is good for well pretty much everything it is probably the old original first patent medicine it is built as follows take of afaraboca henbane carpobalsamum each two drams and a half of cloves opium myrrh cyperus each two drams of opobalsamum indian leaf cinnamon sodori ginger coftus coral cassia euphorbium gum tragacanth frankincense styrax calamita celtic nard spignal heartwort mustard saxifrage dill anise each one dram of silolose rum ponticum alipta moscata castor spikenard galangals opoponax anacardium mastich brimstone peony eringo pulp of dates red and white hermodactyls roses thyme acorns pennyroyal gentian the bark of the root of mandrake germander valerian bishop's weed bayberries long and white pepper silobalsamum carnabadium macedonian parsley seeds lovage the seeds of rue and cinnamon of each a dram and a half of pure gold pure silver pearls not perforated the blata byzantina the bone of the stag's heart of each the quantity of fourteen grains of wheat of sapphire emerald and jasper stones each one dram of hazelnut two drams of pillatory of spain shavings of ivory calamus odoratus each the quantity of twenty-nine grains of wheat of honey or sugar a sufficient quantity serve with a shovel no one might expect such an injunction after such formidable preparation but it is not so the dose recommended is the quantity of an hazelnut only that it is because there is so much jewelry in it no doubt aqua limacum take a great peck of garden snails and wash them in a great deal of beer and make your chimney very clean and set a bushel of charcoal on fire and when they are thoroughly kindled make a hole in the middle of the fire and put the snails in 
and scatter more fire amongst them and let them roast till they make a noise then take them out and with a knife and coarse cloth pick and wipe away all the green froth then break them shells and all in a stone mortar take also a quart of earthworms and scour them with salt diverse times over then take two handfuls of angelica and lay them in the bottom of the still next lay two handfuls of celandine next a quart of rosemary flowers then two handfuls of bear's foot and agrimony then fenugreek then turmeric of each one ounce red dock root bark of barberry trees wood sorrel betony of each two handfuls then lay the snails and worms on the top of the herbs and then two handfuls of goose dung and two handfuls of sheep dung then put in three gallons of strong ale and place the pot where you mean to set fire under it let it stand all night or longer in the morning put in three ounces of cloves well beaten and a small quantity of saffron dried to powder then six ounces of shavings of hartshorn which must be uppermost fix on the head and refrigeratory and distill according to art there the book does not say whether this is all one dose or whether you have a right to split it and take a second chance at it in case you live also the book does not seem to specify what ailment it was for but it is of no consequence for of course that would come out on the inquest upon looking further i find that this formidable nostrum is good for raising flatulencies in the stomach meaning from the stomach no doubt so it would appear that when our progenitors chanced to swallow a sigh they emptied a sewer down their throats to expel it it is like dislodging skippers from cheese with artillery when you reflect that your own father had to take such medicines as the above and that you would be taking them today yourself but for the introduction of homeopathy which forced the old school doctor to stir around and learn something of a rational nature about his business you may honestly feel grateful that homeopathy survived the attempts of the allopathists to destroy it even though you may never employ any physician but an allopathist while you live the end and the end of the one million pound banknote and other new stories by mark twain read by john greenman